What's the word, y'all? There are a lot of teams that had great off seasons from the OKC Thunder who brought in Alex Caruso and Isaiah Hardenstein. That team won 57 games last season. And if you ask me right now who's winning the West, I'm probably going OKC, again, without seeing it on the court. You also have a team like um, the Philadelphia 76ers who had all the cap space in the world and turned that into Paul George and other players that complement Joel Embiid. Or on a lesser note, the continuity of the Boston Celtics who won a championship and didn't lose any players. That matter. I'm sorry, O'Shea Brissett. They didn't lose any players. Like, usually you win a championship. It's like Bruce Brown's going to get $22 million for another team, and then you lost that. No, the Celtics has have everybody back. And there's one team that's, given the circumstances, having such a phenomenal offseason. And that team is the Phoenix Suns. A couple days ago, they brought in Tyus Jones for a minimum. He might have been the best free agent on the market left, and we're just waiting to see what team's going to pay Tyus Jones. We have to go back to Washington. Would he go here? Would he go there? I definitely didn't see one-year minimum contract with the Phoenix Suns happening, and that's such such a good part. Now, obviously, he said that he had other offers on the table. They were multi-year deals, but he wanted to bet on himself to go to the 2025 free agency class where there is more teams, more money, and he's betting on himself. But I can't under understate how insane of a pickup this is for this team specifically. Like, Tyus Jones is a very, very good point guard. The fact that he had a 7-2-1, no disrespect, Washington Wizards fans, I like your direction right now, but the fact that he had a 7-2, 7 7.3 to 1 assist to turnover ratio on the goddamn Wizards is insane to me. He did that with that talent. So imagine when he got Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, and, and Kevin Durant. What that assist to turnover ratio gonna look like then? Like, this is such a good pickup for them, and it should, again, help his market for 2025. And he is on that team. They also had other good pickups. Like, when they brought in Monte Morris, I'm like, yes, they got a point guard. And now that they get Tyus Jones, who's better than Monte, it just works out great because Frank Vogel was asking for a point guard, and they said, no, 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 no. Devin Booker's our point guard. Bradley Beal's our point guard. We don't need a real point guard. They got that. They also brought in a pump, uh, Mason Plumley, And you can argue who's better between Drew, Drew Eubanks and Mason Plumley at this point in their careers. I mean, hell, Mason Plumley almost lost his spot completely out of the out of the Clippers rotation once Daniel Tice got over there. So it's who's better, who's, I guess, only time will tell. Uh, they also brought back Royce O'Neal on a very friendly Royce O'Neal deal. Uh, I could go on and on. These are very good pickups because this team was a second apron team. And if you ain't been keeping up with the CBA, I don't blame you. It's too damn convoluted. But when you're an as expensive te as team as the Phoenix Suns, where you got Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, and Kevin Durant all making max slash super max contracts, the NBA incorporated this thing, the new CBA, that's, that's there to take the air out of these super expensive teams and prevent them from getting much better, right? Second apron teams. This, this offseason were the Warriors. Who, what, did, what did they do this offseason to alleviate some of that? They lost Klay Thompson, and that alleviated some of the second apron stuff. Um, the Clippers, they didn't want to give Paul George all the money he wanted. The Celtics just got like some type of voodoo with this money. Somehow everybody can pay them uh, $50 million on their team, but they, they're fine. You got the Milwaukee Bucks, who also had a really good offseason given the circumstances, but also couldn't do much either. And the Suns turned a second apron team with not much wiggle room to this. Where I look at their potential rotation, and, and based on what Tyus Jones said in his interview, he's going to be the starting point guard, right? So starting point guard is him. Then you got Bradley Beal, Devin Booker as these wings. Devin Booker, I mean, uh, Kevin Durant at the four, and Yusuf Nurkic at the five. That's a solid starting five. And they also now have Grayson Allen coming off the bench, who had such a crazy shooting year. I don't know if he'll be able to replicate it, but maybe he will. You also got Monte Morris off the bench. Royce O'Neal, Josh Okogie, Nazir Little. I don't know if... Josh Okogi or Desir Little ever going to pop, but I always feel like those guys are very close to really being impactful NBA players. They just haven't been able to do it yet. And then you got the Plumlee at the five. That is a real NBA rotation. And I, I, didn't even, I didn't even talk about Ryan Dunn, who when I was doing my scouting for the NBA draft, some people said that he was one of the best offensive wing prospects in the last 20 years. The offense is a lot to be desired, but one of the best offensive prospects of the last 20, I'm, I'm intrigued. I look at all of that. I look at the depth chart. I look at this team. And there's still a lot to be desired somehow. And I can't figure out why. And that's why I'm talking to y'all about it. We have Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, two of the top 10-ish players in basketball. We got Bradley Beal, who had an underwhelming season. I think we can all agree. But we know that Bradley Beal can be um, a, a really good NBA player. We had the shooting of Grayson Allen. And, and all of this stuff. We got now Tyus Jones as a PG. And I'm still looking at this roster like, I'm taking OKC over it. I'm taking Minnesota over it. 
I'm taking probably still Denver over it, even without KCP. Like, there are still teams out west that I trust more than this roster, and I can't figure out why. And I ain't even mentioned the team that was in the goddamn championship this year, the Dallas Mavericks. So I just named four teams that off rip I feel more comfortable with. And again, we're in the offseason right now. Maybe Coach Bud, which is the best, the best or the biggest offseason acquisition for them. Maybe Coach Bud gets everything going, and what I'm talking about today doesn't even matter. But I just named four to five teams that I feel more comfortable with having that deep run and winning the championship just out west. Just out west. And that is... Not good. <laughs> it's just not good. Last year, the Phoenix Suns were the 12th best defense in basketball. And that is extremely impressive. And I don't know if that's like, because Coach Vogel was known as a defensive-minded coach. I don't know if that's him just really getting it going. Because I look at this roster, and it's not a ton of defenders that you really, really love. Um, Devin Booker has showed that he can do. I mean, hell, we're watching him in the Olympics right now be the, one of the lockdown defenders. But you just don't don't expect him to do that every night and also give you 27 points per game. I didn't love what I saw from Bradley Beal this one year so far in Phoenix defensively. Yusuf Nurkic just doesn't provide the rim protection that a normal NBA team would have on that back five. And like Tyus Jones, he's a competitor. Competitor, I wouldn't call him a, a terrible defender, but he's not a guy that's elevated in defense. So I mentioned that starting five, and I just don't know what to really expect from that. But it's more than just saying, oh, the defense probably won't be as good as it was last year. This was their first year together, and I think there was a lot to be desired. Like, when, when they ended up making the deal to put this big three together, one of my major complaints and a lot of people's major complaints or, or things that they were concerned about was there are so many overlapping skill sets where all three of those dudes are known to be bucket getters, mid-range killers. They're going to get theirs, and that's the way it is. There was a lot of overlap there, and I think that is... That is still the case. Now, the best thing about bringing in the Tyus Jones and the Monte Moores is that Devin Booker has become such a phenomenal playmaker throughout the course of his career that you're not counting on D-Book to be point book or you're not counting on Bradley Beal to be the point guard version of himself where he can kind of think at his normal mindset, which is, yes, I can play make, I can create for others, but hell, I can average 28. I can average 30 or I have averaged 30 if you ask a Bradley Beal. But now these dudes, these point guards can really help things get kind of initiated on the offensive side of the ball. But that big three, their big three there, had a net rating together in 800 minutes of 6.7, which is pretty good. It is pretty good. But it's not as good as you want it to be. This is, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to bring some stats. Let, let me put it on the same playing field. So the net rating is actually 6.6. I think I said 6.7 before. I gave him a little bit too much credit. But in that 862 minutes they played together, the 6.6 .6 net rating is the exact same as LeBron, Rui Hachimura, and Austin Reeves. Again, 6.7 .6 is a really good net rating for a three-man lineup. But when you think about the amount of money you're spending and the lack of flexibility you really have by paying these three guys this amount of money, you want their net rating to be higher than LeBron James and two role players. You want it to be over a lineup of Paul George, Zubac, and Terrence Mann. You want it to be higher than a lineup of Josh Hart, Jalen Brunson, and Dante DiVincenzo. Do you see this trend here? These guys have one star player and two role players and their net rating are as the same or, or higher. Now, for what it's worth, maybe that's maybe that's not the greatest um, argument to have considering the best net rating of any top three in the NBA this season that played 800 minutes was Isaiah Hardenstein, Josh Hart, and Jalen Brunson. They had some type of voodoo stuff going on um, with the New York Knicks. Um, but you just want it to be my big three is a big three. A majority of that is that the, the offense together had an offensive rating of 123.6, which is crazy. It is insane. That's obviously those three guys are bucket getters and you have to make a decision. You can't guard all three at the same time. It's a defensive rating of 116.89 that is really hindering that team from potentially being in the upper echelon. Again, we're only talking about 800 minutes while some of these other teams have had, you know, thousands, a thousand plus minutes played together. But still, maybe it is just that defensive side of the ball with those three guys on the court being that bad that's hindering me or preventing me from feeling comfortable with putting them in the, the top tier of Western Conference team. And there is an insane amount of pressure. Me personally, last year, I'm not even tripping about when you think about all the roster turnaround they had going into last season where they lost 11 players and brought in 10 new dudes, and I, nobody should have even expected that team to be good. Now, I also didn't expect them to get their ass wiped like they did in the, in the playoffs, but I didn't expect that team to go out and win a championship year number one. I think that's unreasonable or that's just not realistic to think that a team that was put together like that can really come in and win a championship year number one. But now it's year two. 
And there's a new coach and Coach Bud, who, again, who's better between Bud and Vogel? I don't really have the answers for that. At time will tell. And this is the pressure season because other general managers across the association, they're on the prowl. You, you saw the Houston Rockets was trying to do. They, they put that trade together with the Brooklyn Nets to get the Suns picks because they wanted to go out and try to get Kevin Durant. These other teams are waiting for the opportunity to pounce. And Matt Ishby and company are under pressure to win, not make it to the second round, not, not just have a competitive first round series. No, they are there to win. And I can't look at this roster and say that they're going to. Maybe that's my lack of um, trust, I would say, in Yusuf Nurkic at this age, at uh, this point of his career. Well, I just look at the way other teams are building and the really successful teams. I just don't think Yusuf Nurkic necessarily fits for a lot of the stuff that you want for a 2024 defensive team. At the same time, I really do like their offseason, man. I, re I really do like how, how much they got better on paper Given the circumstance, here are the things I'm most curious about going into the season. Um, with Tyce Jones being the point guard, I'm assuming that means we're going to get a lot more catch and shoot opportunities for Bradley Beal. And Bradley Beal early in his career came into the NBA as a shooter. And for the first years of his career, he was that. And then he turned into a scorer and that kind of dropped his three point percentage because he was creating for himself. Uh, last year, he shot over 40 percent from three. And now I'm thinking about with Tyce Jones being the point guard, how many opportunities we could see for Bradley Beal to be a spot-up shooter. Not saying that's his entire role because he's being paid 50-something million dollars. You don't want to pay a spot-up shooter 50-something million dollars, but like to have him be able to catch his shoe more often is, is pretty elite. I'm also watching Kevin Durant and Devin Booker in the Olympics and seeing how much they've been able to just adapt. Kevin Durant adapting is like, hey, y'all need points. I got that. But like Devin Booker adaption is like, Y'all need some dirty work hustle players? I can do that. Now, you don't expect him to do that in the regular season because, again, he's a guy that can average 28. So so, so on, on Team USA, he can be okay with shooting four shots and putting a lot of the energy defensively. You can't do that with the Suns in the regular season. They need him to be 27, 28 book. But at the same time, they need him to be defensive book as well. So I don't know. I don't know. I know I just rambled a bunch about it. I'm giving their offseason an A. I still just don't put them in the upper echelon of contenders in the Western Conference. And maybe I, I would probably need to see two really, really good months under Bud for that to change. I need to see how differently they look defensively um, with all of those guys on the court together. I need to see how creative they can get on, on offense. I always think about that. Some of these teams get the star power and the creativity it's just gone from the offensive side of the ball because it is just easy to say, Kevin, get us a bucket, and he's one of the best bucket getters ever. Or Devin Booker, we say, get a bucket. He's one of the best bucket getters currently in basketball. It's easy to do it that way. But I like when teams can be able to bring in this talent and also have some fluidity to the offense and kind of, I don't know, just creativity. Because I, I don't want to say that their offense wasn't fluid because it was. Don't get me wrong. That, I misspoke. It was a fluid offense. It wasn't very creative. And I think they can be creative now with the new point guard and all of these offensive weapons. So you let me know what you think about the Finger Suns offseason.